Hey guys, welcome to Dialed In Live. Uh, I'm your host, Kyle Burt. Today we are sitting down with a man uh, behind the future of 5G, uh, future technologies, Peter Capiello. Uh, hope I said that right, Peter. But Peter has 15 All years. Good. 15 years in the wireless space, uh, sales background led him to being the CEO of Future Technologies. He's personally, uh, personally, and the company's best known for being agile problem solvers to fix existing networks to function efficiently to design and build new networks for public and private customers. Essentially, what that means is they spent the last 10 years building private tied cellular networks. So think LTE, think AT&T, Verizon, but at a private corporate company level. So really advanced technologies that we're talking about here. And uh, we're going to get into a, a 5G discussion here today and talk about is this 5G thing, is, is it hype? Is it overhyped? Or is it a, a, a real reality that we're all going to be living in very soon? And, and what are the implications of that? So uh, Peter Caviello, welcome to the show, man. Uh, Let's start off right away with what are you the most dialed into, man? I, I think for us, it's all about connecting the dots. So uh, whether we're in the uh, rail yard, the oil and gas field, a mine, uh, we're out in a tactical environment with the military, our job is to basically connect things that aren't connected. Uh, <laughs> a little crazy, actually, because uh, it's non-tangible, but... Uh, 20 years ago when the company was founded, that was what we did. And as the technology is involved, uh, our founder, Nino Canoe, uh, I don't know uh, if he had a rock hit him in the head, but calling the company Future Technologies uh, 20 years ago made sense because we just keep evolving. But uh, connecting the dots is definitely uh, definitely what we're focused on. Nice, nice. So, yeah, tell me a little bit about uh, about how you guys got, got into this, right? Uh, I know we were talking a little bit before um, about my background in AT&T. So, like, what was your background? Like, what? how did you end up here? Yeah, so me, me personally, uh, I had got an entry-level sales job out of college. Uh, turned out we were combining a uh, system that we had with, uh, uh, with WiMAX at the time. And uh, it was pretty cutting edge back in, in 2006. We were able to offer 20 megabit of over-the-air internet. Uh, and slowly, WiMAX drifted to be uh, towards the 4G standard. And uh, that early on, it was all international. And it opened up at the U.S. market in 2007, 2008 with Clearwire and then with Sprint. Uh, so for me, it was a natural progression into the U.S. market, where before that, I was in India I was in Latin America, in Europe, and uh, traveling over there is a good experience, but it, it wears on you. So we uh, ended up switching firms to Future Tech, and uh, Future Tech was founded in uh, 1999 by our founder and was originally a satellite installation company. Oh, no way. And then with, uh, nine, yeah, and then in 9-11, in, in, uh, in after 9-11, uh, there was an opportunity to extend satellite uh, connections uh, for military applications, and uh, they extended into uh, kind of private networks at that point for the military. Um, the rest was kind of history. We went from satellite to fixed broadband to uh, 3G to 4G, and now we're at this uh, crossroad where 5G is finally, uh, you know, uh, showing itself. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, uh, quick shout out to Michael Evans out there from Florence, South Carolina. How's it going, Michael? Um, dialed in. If you guys are new to this show, we're going to have this talk. It's going to be an open forum, open conversation. So feel free to chime in the comments or at any point in time during the show, you can dial into our conference bridge here, 214-856-2389. You can call in, be connected immediately with us and uh, interject your stories, comments, or questions. So uh, I, I like that story. Uh, I, I told you a little bit about mine. Like I kind of grew up in uh, the wireless realm as well, but more so like the wireless sales realm. So um, I was kind of an early adopter to selling this stuff and like selling one of the first Blackberries, dating myself a little bit, but selling the very first iPhone huh. and just kind of came up through through the ranks of that. And that's how I ended up at like corporate enterprise AT&T before I started on my own. So um, always been fascinated with uh, the wireless technologies just because, you know, I've been, been in it, been so close to it. So, you know, people talk a lot about this 5G thing, this 5G hype. Um, I, I think I personally get it. Uh, I know you get it. But I think a lot of people out there, like some people think it's going to solve like world hunger <laughs> and stuff. Like, you know, some people take it a little too far. Um, but, you know, what, what's the realization versus the hype of, you know, what 5G is really going to accomplish for us? 
I, I mean, and nobody knows that full answer, right? I'm, even even you, because it's not here yet entirely, right? But uh, just in your purview from what you expect to see. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, you know, as it relates to today, I mean, we see, uh, especially in Asia, early adoption where um, they put a lot of hardware out there and now they're software updating to offer 5G in places like Korea. Uh, and based upon the density of their network, it's a much smaller parcel of uh, land to cover than the U.S. You know, they're, they're early adopters in doing that. Um, in the U.S. market, uh, you know, it's, it's been a process. It took about 10 years for 4G to mature to where we see it today. And, you know, we could walk down the road and watch video. And that's, uh, you mentioned the first iPhone. Back then, we were happy to have uh, pictures uh, sent. Uh, you know, now it's, it's pretty stable, but it took 10 years to get to that point. And every day, you know, there's still a lot of capital being put into those networks by the, by the big carriers. Um, but where, where it sits uh, currently, you have, you know, Verizon with their ultra wideband, uh, which is in a higher frequency doing very high capacity. Um, and, and that's great. And, and you can see, especially around Super Bowl time, it's very uh, uh, clear that everybody's trying to demonstrate what's, uh, what technology is available. And, and the Super Bowl has become kind of a spotlight to that. Right, um, right. Yeah, with Verizon, Verizon, Verizon's 5G broadcast cameras, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, they, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to create a, uh, you know, uh, alternative experience while you're at the game. Uh, and with, with that spectrum they have, they can do a lot. It's, uh, it's basically, uh, it's the, the largest highway that's out there based upon the channel size. And if you, if you look at the Super Bowl ads as a counterpoint, you have uh, T-Mobile who very timely launched their 600 megahertz with very low frequency band with less lanes in the highway, more of a, a smaller channel size. The benefit is they have tremendous coverage um, and, and they've done that. They uh, plan their network well and they're taking advantage of that low frequency band. So, you know, their big highlight at the Super Bowl was coverage, not capacity. Right. Um, and and, 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 and you know, they're, they're, prep, they're prepping us for, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but they're prepping us for this 5G fall release that we think is coming. Probably, I think at this point we know it's coming, right? iPhone, Apple kind of leads. There's already 5G phones, right? But Apple kind of, you know, they have the market dominance, uh, at least here in the U.S. So uh, this year they're expected to launch 5G phones. So, of course, we, we, they got to hype us up for this, right? Yeah, no, 100%. And, and, you know, not to get overly technical, but, you know, what we're seeing um, adopted is, is kind of a non-standalone network uh, with our, so on the, on the core side, uh, basically the brain of the, the 5G network. What we're seeing currently is the phones are coming out where they're still going to utilize 4G as its primary communication point, especially for voice. I mean, if you think about it, voice is a critical application. If you have a 911 emergency voice is very important. So how things are set up is that the new phones will still attach to the 4G network for voice, carry that that traffic because the network's there and it's stable. But then where you have 5G coverage, you're going to be able to connect and do uh, augmented reality, um, you know, 4K video. You know, as a, for a consumer, that's really interesting stuff. Um, you know, so I, I think. We, we've seen the capital by the, the, the primary carriers uh, be put in place to have the hardware there. And now it's a matter of moving and turning on the software and having it planned so that as they turn on more and more 5G, uh, it's planned out and, and thought through because they got to make sure that you know, the consumer traffic, especially 911 calls, are, are handled the right way. Right. Um, if there's first first responders using that network. Like AT&T has been investing heavily in FirstNet, which is yeah, the, the yeah. national public safety network. And, you know, that's, that's a huge investment that uh, of money, you know, tens of billions of dollars. And, uh, you know, they're being very careful around their 5G. Um, you know, they want to be active in 5G, but, you know, because they're carrying all those uh, first responders traffic, I think they're being careful around not over rotating and launching 5G too early. So, a lot of hype. In reality, uh, some of the things that people talk about with 5G in the future, autonomous vehicles, 
ultra low latency for uh, automation of, of different networks, the security benefits, because there's end to end encryption. You know, we're, re we're really not there. I mean, we'll see that maturity over the next five years. Um, and that's, that, that's kind of where things sit right now. Um, there's a couple of things with the FCC that's going on as far as, uh, you know, again, spectrum is basically how many lanes there are in the highway. And if, if you, you know, read up a bit, they, uh, the carriers have an opinion that there's not enough spectrum available in the low band and the mid band. And uh, the FCC is trying to address that. And they're going to be doing some more uh, spectrum releases in the mid band to make 5G uh, more competitive because in other areas of the world, like Asia, they have a lot of low band and mid band that will go farther. And in the U S market, that's been locked up. And uh, I, I do think the FCC is uh, addressing that, but it takes time. Right. Right. So, yeah. It, you know, it, gets, it gets pretty political pretty fast uh, on that side of side, yeah. side of things. So um, <laughs> yeah. quick shout out, quick shout out to Chris Walls, uh, the free kid. Thanks for tuning in, man. Uh, Chris is the one who actually kind of set up this meeting. Uh, so I uh, appreciate that. I understand he, he works for you, Peter. Yeah, he, he's been with us for over five years. Uh, former military serviceman, uh, good man. Uh, he's out uh, right now uh, with our customer Unity Fiber helping uh, get they're, they're doing a lot of uh, fiber upgrades in the southeast region, and Chris is helping them with that uh, project for us. We, we appreciate that. Nice, nice, excellent. And then uh, uh, shout out to Tim Hammer as well, uh, a, a local here with me in uh, Dallas area. Um, he uh, has a question. Well, he said, 5G is obviously a game changer, but when should we expect the tech to be leveraged commercially versus residentially uh, versus the residential customer rollout? And then from what he's seen, um, the big guys are largely focused on reaching the people versus reaching the business. So what's your two cents on that? No, I think, I think that's, that's very accurate. I think the, uh, the current benefit of businesses would be where Verizon's got their ultra uh, wideband uh, 5G. They're using that for fixed wireless access. Yeah, so you're, and, you're, talking um, like, like, you're talking like rural areas potentially, right? So using fixed wireless as opposed to like bringing fiber in, which, which it's not very economic, economical, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's right. I mean, even in urban centers, though, um, the nature of the spectrum that Verizon has, uh, we're seeing them to be able to uh, leverage their 5G infrastructure for fixed wireless in, a, in an urban environment and be very competitive on price where – Maybe uh, fiber can't get there uh, in a timely manner or can't hit the price point because there's a lot of uh, um, uh, conduit work that has to be done driving the price up. And, I, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing that happen, uh, especially, you know, if you, if you look at small to medium businesses that don't require gigabits of capacity, if it's just a matter of like re replacing T1s and having a low latency connection, you know, that that that's a current uh, business opportunity, but you know, the, the sexiness of 5g is really around uh, like the uh, industry 4.0 space and automation. Mm -hmm. And yep. there, there's just, there's just not enough network out there to actually cover those assets and collect sensor data and things like that. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking uh, a couple hundred thousand sites that are in the macro network nationally, and it, it takes a while to upgrade those. And we're, we're not going to see that type of use case for a, a couple of years. I mean, it's just, it takes time to get it built. Oh, yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Um, shout out to Zian uh, out there, a little uh, back and forth with Tim. That's awesome. Uh, Tim had a follow up, um, or is there even a difference to who gets access to what when? I think you kind of answered that, but. Um, is there a difference to who gets access to what and when? What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, you know, on on the, um, you know, when we when we looked at this session, it was kind of twofold. So five G is 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 something that we all want to see kind of come come forward and have the benefit. One of one of the big things we're seeing in the enterprise space is uh, private LTE. And um, a driver for that is recently we talked about uh, the, the FCC being involved. They opened up the CBRS uh, frequency band. Uh, and there's 150 megahertz of spectrum, which is quite a bit. It's in the mid band. And um, it's, it's available to uh, businesses and uh, 
um, you know, non-carrier folks as well as carrier folks. So, so wait, so wait what, what, so you, said, that, you said CBRS. What was that allocated for before? It's just so like we know where it came from. Yeah, no. So, so the, the government had the, uh, the spectrum allocated for other use cases like satellite and uh, other governments. So they had to, over the last 10 years, they had to clean up that spectrum, uh, reband things, and then allocate it. Um, there, there was uh, 50 megahertz of spectrum that was opened up back in, I want to say, 2008, which was in that like uh, adjacent to that. But it had limitations on how much power you could use, and also the technology ten years ago isn't is not as good as uh, you know LT as it stands today. Yeah. So yeah. that that goes back to my early days when we were doing WiMAX. That was the 20 megabit uh, service that was available. Uh, now, I mean, we can go and do you know 100 plus megabit uh, on a sector that's so 5x, and um, it. The real interesting thing is like you could use it for an internet service provider for a consumer, but uh, we're seeing a lot of manufacturing facilities looking to leverage LTE in place of their Wi-Fi systems. Uh, we're looking at, really? uh, if you picture a million square, oh yeah. So how does that work? So, um, so first of all, we're talking about a lot of complex things that we're talking about. Building your own private cellular network for a company, right? And you're saying... That they yeah. they might use that instead of a traditional Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of uh, so you know where where things are shifting. So if we picture picture a very simple setting, we have a million square foot wide open building that's doing logistics. Let's say okay. so typically they're thirty foot in height and there there's corridors and it's a matter of utilizing every square inch horizontally and vertically. So it lends itself to real-time automation and autonomous. Uh, so if you look at what Amazon's doing, you know, Amazon has a lot of robots. Uh, they have a lot of automation that, that goes into those warehouse environments. And using Wi-Fi as the standard, it's an option and it's there and it's viable. Sometimes our company uses Wi-Fi. But there's benefits to LTE where... Uh, one example, the uh, security side, you're using a SIM card, which basically is an encrypted uh, way of connecting to the network just to simplify things. But like the robots that are running around in these warehouses um, are going to be operating more securely because they're using a SIM authentication versus a traditional IT Wi-Fi authentication. Um, the, that Security is a big issue. Uh, or, or reason. And then the other, the other driver is latency. So if you're, if you have a computer that's controlling these robots in that environment and it takes, uh, I'm, I'm going to exaggerate, it takes one second to go to the robot and then back to the, the computer that's controlling it. And then you could do it in, let's say 10 milliseconds, which would be one tenth of the time. It's a, it's a, uh, one hundredth of the time. It's, it's a huge difference in how fast they can react and respond and, and also uh, work in the same environment because now it's not, we're not just worried about robots and people like pedestrians in the area. You have robots actually working together in these environments and that, that ability to do everything as close to real time as possible connecting back to the computer is, is, is a huge uh, safety uh, item. And also uh, from a, an efficiency perspective, every millisecond matters in that environment. And, um, and it's driving those IT decisions to be uh, moving towards uh, LTE uh, instead of Wi-Fi in some cases. Not all cases, but, but in some cases where you need that ultra low latency and security, um, you know, I'm pointing to Amazon just as like kind of the 800 pound gorilla in that space. But right. We're seeing that there's, there's, there's a company that uh, came out uh, 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 called the Adabotic, um, and they basically have a logistics solution that uses robots as modular. And, and, and they uh, did a demonstration with Microsoft at the Microsoft Ignite event where they're, they're deploying private LTE in a Microsoft environment an Azure Stack Edge, so it's, it's, it's actually taking the cloud, distributing it to that location. They're putting a 
uh, LP core in that environment. And then right next to it, they have the, I'm going to say computer again, but application that's running the robots. But by everything being there, the robots can run more and more efficiently, which is, you know, at the end of the day is about money. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the logistics business, like in Amazon's business, like every, you want prime now, like you want this thing in like two hours in order to get it to you in two hours. Like we have to cut every millisecond. We have to scrape every millisecond we can in order to get it to your door, but in two hours. Right. And even that's not fast enough for some of us. Right. So that's, what's driving uh, this. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. A hundred percent. So we're talking about in this environment, maybe a, uh, I don't know, a bottle of, uh, bottle of shampoo moving around a logistics facility. So take that. And now instead of it being in a very simple environment, we go to a, a gold mine that's instead of it being a million square foot box, we now have a multi mile hole in the ground where they're, where they're mining uh, gold. And now we're trying to go further in distance because it's a large, you know, it could be a, a mile in diameter. Um, and instead of moving a, uh, uh, a bottle of shampoo, now we're moving, they have what's called a hauler. It's basically a large truck the size of a house and it's moving iron ore. Um, Kyle, let me ask you a question. So what, what do you think in value each haul, so a dump truck, think of a, a big dump truck the size of your house. Okay, yep. How, how much gold do you think is in each load in, in, in one of those scenarios, in one of those haulers. Like, like you're saying a dump truck that's hauling like pure gold or are they holding like gold like inside of rocks and stuff? I, 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 iron ore. So uh, iron ore. That, so basically they're, mo they're, they're taking ore that's been mined okay. and they're transferring it from the, the open pit to the factory where they'll basically put it into the factory and then produce uh, basically gold bricks. But that, that raw ore, one big truckload, what do you think that runs? Oh, geez, you're testing my math skills here. Um, let's see, one big truckload. What do I think? What do I think it's worth in like monetary value, or how much gold I think there is? Yeah. Um, percentage wise. Yeah, mon monetary value. Oh, uh, monetary. Jeez, man. I don't know. What's the price? Uh, Alexa, what's the price of gold right now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one thousand five hundred is uh, one thousand per. Per whatever, yeah. right? So, uh, I would say uh, uh, a truckload. Uh, let's go with uh, one, th uh, ten million. I don't know. That's probably way. That's probably way too much. Uh, no, uh, uh, well, that's good. You aired <laughs> So it's about two hundred. It's about two hundred thousand dollars per 200, load, dollars. depending upon the truck size. Okay. Okay. So, so, it, so, so now. Wow! In this, wow I, in completely, this, I completely my, failed that. That was like way over the. I, I just. Well, I just failed. The price is wrong. The price is wrong. <laughs> there we go. The price. The price. That's right. Alexa's wrong. Alexa's wrong. Uh, so. So. So, so, but in, in a warehouse environment, we're moving a, a $2 piece of shampoo. We want to do it really efficient. In these mine environments, the haulers can only move 20 miles per hour. So being efficient and running, they run 12-hour shifts. Being efficient and doing these, you know, basically go to the, uh, the mining location, fill up, drive safely 20 miles an hour, go to the factory, drop it off, and then go back. What... Using Wi-Fi is, is not really possible to connect to it and go fully autonomous because Wi-Fi would require a lot of uh, towers, let's say, to cover that area. Oh, yeah. Now, plus, plus, you, uh, plus uh, as, you, as you leave one Wi-Fi zone, then you'd have to auto-join another. And then, you know, auto-joining and all that, like, that stuff induces complexity the, that, you know, you might not. The, hand, the, the handoff is a complex. That, that's right. Because Wi-Fi really wasn't built to be doing vehicle handoff is built for for more of a campus environment so so the the opportunity there is we can reduce the number of towers which is good reduces cost we could make it the latency lower and by doing that you could actually run and we've done this we you can run autonomous trucks and now instead of and and, and uh, one, uh, one misconception when people when we talk about autonomous uh use cases people think we're putting folks out of business uh like you know johnny the driver doesn't have a job what actually happens is johnny now instead of driving a a truck in a hazardous environment johnny's now in a controlled setting driving that vehicle so it's not necessarily that it's going to be fully autonomous it just means that 
Johnny doesn't have to be in the vehicle. You know, and these are these are hazardous environments. But but now the vehicle can run basically efficiently for a twelve hour shift and then go into maintenance. It makes a huge difference uh, in the yield. So if we can get, let's say we get in a twelve hour shift, if you get one more load, it's two hundred grand. If you get ten more loads, it's it's two million dollars. It's, it. it's pretty significant, and 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 the pri- private LT right now provides that. What will happen in the future is these private LT networks will migrate to be 5G, and in areas where, um, like Rio Tinto has a mine just outside of uh, Salt Lake City, it happens to be right next to. It's the largest copper mine in the world. It's actually you can see it from space. It's it's the largest open pit mine in the whole world. Where where is that uh, at? You said Salt, be- near Salt Lake City. It's just outside. It's uh, just outside Salt Lake City. It's uh, the Kennecott uh, copper mine. So you can like uh, you can like you can see like if you go to Google Maps right now and you you can go try to find it, you can kind of see like copper color. Oh, oh, oh you, well, you can see the mine site. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know that you you would see. Oh, okay. Well, it's actually visible if you're if you're in if you're in space in the the space station. It's actually uh, it's a recognizable object from space. Interesting. Okay. It's that big. All right. Yeah. But, but, but in the future, because that's so close to Salt Lake city, you could see 5g built out and then 5g provided by a carrier actually service that mine because it's not in a remote setting. It's right next to the city. So there'll be this, this bleeding point where between now and then, you know, the mines have to go out, they have to provide connectivity. Maybe Wi-Fi doesn't make sense. Maybe private LT makes sense on the CBRS band. There's also another derivative where some of like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, they're recognizing that maybe private LT has to be provided as a managed service. Yeah, but but so, so, in, so there, there, of, there is there is a theoretical limit of how many people can have a private LTE, right? No, not not really. I mean, no? uh cuz cuz no, so I mean, you, uh, they, they don't they wouldn't they wouldn't then own the spectrum. So would they be like in this private pool of like like kind of like the cloud is like yeah. multi-tenant so like they're using the same spectrum that other private networks are using but somehow that's right there, somehow there's no crosstalk like if you go to like a, a really good wi-fi area there's no crosstalk meaning like my iphone can't see yours like that's real that's a secure wi-fi zone uh as best as you can right so it'd be kind of like that right so you'd be in the same spectrum yeah, yeah, but no, we're, we're, we're walled off yeah no that, that's an excellent point so so the CBRS band, which is really what's driving this this private LTE boom in the U.S. market. Well, what what does the CBRS the, stand for? What, I'm sorry to cut you off again. What does the CBRS stand for? Uh, citizen broadband, and I'm I'm gonna uh, it's citizen. <laughs> I, I I don't recall the acronym. We have so many acronyms. So so the the, 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 the name the name of it doesn't even matter. Then like we love acronyms. So like the CBRS that that doesn't really mean, have much meaning. It's just that's just where the band came from, right? Yeah, it's it's the name that the FCC gave this 150 okay. megahertz of spectrum. Okay, got it. Um, and but 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 what what happens uh, in that environment? Let's say let's say we're in uh, let's say we're in Frisco, right? And we have a WISP that wants to use that spectrum. We have the municipality that wants to use that spectrum. We have a utility company that wants to use the spectrum. What the government did is they said, okay, we're going to make this spectrum available. You right. have to register to use it. And they identified third parties that would be the intermediary to manage that. So uh, Google is one of them. Uh, Federated is one of them. Uh, Comscope is one of them. And what they are is basically an intermediary exchange. So they, uh, there are sensors that are out there that uh, look at different things. And then what happens is if you have a network uh, built in that setting, you would register, you'd plug in, and your your network would actually connect to these intermediaries to kind of and make sure that, uh, to the best uh, uh, possible, make sure that everybody's using the spectrum efficiently and coordinating with each other. And it's all done through, uh, you know, software to coordinate all that real time. And that's that's what's going to be there, and that's that's a big difference between Wi-Fi, where anybody can go and deploy Wi-Fi. There's no, um, you know, exchange that's making sure that that's managed uh, well and efficient. 
and that's that that's a big advantage because uh it reduces the amount of like uh noise that's out there and improves the performance of the network oh yeah yeah no that that does make sense and that that's kind of tying into a quick shout out to uh, uh pat benoit uh, thanks for tuning in. He corrected us. Citizens ban radio system. So I pretty much got it. Um, there we go. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Wallace said a uh, question for you. Well, he said gold mines definitely need private LTE network. Um, but what kind of security encryptions are available for a secure network? So he's just, he's, he's tossing you, tossing you a, a slam dunk here. Huh. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I would say that the, the biggest advantage from a security perspective is the, uh, is the encrypted uh, SIM. Side of things, so you know, and we, we do this for the. I guess I didn't explain so, this so, at the so, beginning. So, so, so encry- ten- encrypted SIM card, right? So we're talking about the SIM card is encrypted. So, uh, what does that mean? That means that I can't go like duplicate that SIM. I can't go into an AT and T store that's, and get a SIM and be on your network. That 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 that's right. So so uh, let's say in the in the case when um, one of the one of the mine customers that we have. Uh, they wanted to have a completely private network and they wanted to have their own SIM card. So there's registration that you have to have to have a, a, a different parameters registered with, uh, let's say, the authorities. And then um, there's companies that make the, the actual plastic SIM that has all of those properties in there. And then it's, it's secure through encryption where when you go into that environment, your device would see the, the wireless network and all, all it does is request access to the network. It goes back to the computer that's running the private LTE and then the computer will say, okay, I, I recognize this SIM card and authenticate it there and send back a signal only at that point when, when the, uh, the, the, the SIM card's activated, there'll actually be uh, data traffic going back and forth, which makes it much, much more secure and again, it's in, it's in, it's encrypted in that data packet. Now, when we go to 5G, we're going to have end-to-end encryption on that pathway, which will increase that even further, um, because uh, 4G was meant for more consumers. Where when they develop 5G, it's going to be even more end-to-end encrypted, and that's going to be one of the other benefits that we see when 5G comes out. Oh, okay. So, right. makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Um, but, uh, yeah. Appreciate Chris lobbing that one out there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so what but, else, man? Uh, what, what else? Uh, so you've been doing this, you've been doing this with future technology. So this is, this is your company. It sounds like you had some partners involved, right? Um, but you've been doing this with, yeah. with future technologies for the last 10 years. Is that right? Yeah. So we, we, uh, we were always in the private network side, but we got in the private cellular network side because of the government. So we had some very specific requests from the government uh, where um, they have large training centers where they have to have communications, and sometimes there's no other option, so they have to build their own communications network. So, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we were successful in winning some contracts where we built, and this will date it, 2G, 3G networks that we then modernized to 4G. Uh, but because we were doing that for the government, it was really unique because there, there was no scaling down of a, of a cellular network. So it was very expensive uh, to do those types of projects. Uh, but we built up the competency where we knew how to design them, provide the equipment. And then uh, we have one network that we've been maintaining uh, for, for eight years for the client. Um, and, you know, through that, Obviously, we have to be very secure with how we handle a government network. Um, you know, we, we really feel that we have a running head start for the market because this the CBRS ban just opened up commercially last month. And there's people that are trying to get into private LTE, but they're starting day one where oh, we basically yeah. have a 10-year running head start. Yeah, so you're, you, that's just another iteration for you for you guys. Um, and uh, real quick, if you guys are just tuning in, we're talking about five G. As you can t- if, as you can tell, if you have any questions, comments, stories, or anything to share, or you just want to be connected to uh, Peter Capiel here, um, dial into the bridge right now two one four eight five six two three eight nine. That'll make you a live caller on the show right this second, and we can have a serendipitous conversation about this. Um, so Peter, <laughs> can you uh, can you kind of elaborate more into uh, that was a great example, but can you take us deeper? 
into maybe another example. I know this stuff is kind of hard to talk about, especially on, on a live format, because you got to be careful what you say here. <laughs> but um, is is there yeah. is there anything that you can share that like like wow, like we would just be like wow, that that's that's awesome. We want to hear that story. Yeah, I mean, you know, cool cool things that we've done. Um, I, I want to be that we're on a, a live line. I want to think about how to phrase things. Ch- change but, everyone, uh, change everyone's names to John Doe and ABC Company. It's fine. <laughs> and don't don't yeah. tell us where they're well, located. So I, yeah, no. So so we talked about deploying networks in a warehouse. We talked about deploying networks at a mine site. And and the the first example I gave was an was a uh, an open pit mine where basically we're on the ground surface and there's a big hole in the earth. Uh, we've also deployed some networks underground where we're uh, a mile and a half under the surface in tunnels. An, under, uh, an underground, trying... mile and a half underground cellular network. That's that's pretty fascinating. That's, right. that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. How did, how did, know, how did the, that come about? Big... Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a project in Canada. Um, and they were trying to get better health and safety analytics underground where they, they wanted to, uh, they have walkie talkies for voice, but what they wanted to do is make a data network that could get them sensor data so they could know where their people are for location-based services. They want to know where their equipment is and just collect data. And uh, what, one of the things that we saw was that for every five Wi-Fi access points, we could deploy an LTE network that uh, with one. So it was a five to one difference. And when you're, building and maintaining infrastructure a mile and a half underground, it makes a big difference when you could deploy one instead of five uh, oh, yeah, to yeah. collect the data. So, so, uh, but there's challenges, right? There's no GPS underground. So, you know, how do you, how do you do that? Uh, you, you know, it's great that we could go and transmit stuff, but then it's like, okay, we want to transmit. We want to know where things are and there's no GPS. Yeah. So things we have to figure out. Right, it's almost um, like you guys need to we, some, some like RFID type thing. I don't even know how you would do it to just like tag the location where you are underground, right? These are these are secrets that we figured out. <laughs> yeah, uh, yep. but we'll, we'll leave it. We'll leave it no, there then. <laughs> yeah, no. So so that's that's a cool thing. You know, we we also have tactical systems where you know we work with um, with the military where we can do uh, suitcase uh, packages where. Uh, basically a, uh, a military battalion could go out, uh, open up a case and within 30 minutes have a, a, a fully broadcasting, uh, private LTE network. And this is at like an infantry level, uh, where they can now use LTE in place of an old, uh, uh, two-way system that was only for voice. Now they can do video, they can collect data, they can, uh, obviously do voice. Is, is, uh, is, that, is, that, that is that using is that, is that using satellite? I assume. Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes we'll send the, the the system out, and it'll have no internet connectivity, so it's just a local system that okay. you know. Picture of setting up a base camp, and then we want to connect to people in the area for a mission. We can do that, um, and then other times it is satellite relayed. Where if if that's what the uh, if that's what the mission requires, we can we can connect back over a satellite and uh, connect out to the world. Sometimes we don't want to do that. Yep. 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 <laughs> Yeah, um, exactly. Because it's know, probably other, probably easily e- easier to pick that up, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's sometimes everything just wants to be uh, left local. But um, you know, we're we're seeing things. Um, networks in flight is a uh, is an area where we're getting a lot of requests. Um, we had uh, uh, responded to an RFQ for uh, a geologist who was looking to collect sensor data in uh, Southeast Asia. We haven't deployed that network yet, but we're starting to see use cases like that where they're dropping uh, ground sensors in, in the ground to evaluate the soil, and they don't want to set up a, a fixed network, so they want to put a network in a drone and fly over and collect basically statistics off of the soil to evaluate whether there's diamonds there. Uh, so we're, you know, it, it, it brings us into uh, being that, uh, so for us, it's, we we provide the brain that runs the network. We provide the radio equipment, but we're kind of uh, very flexible around where are we putting the equipment? Are we putting it in the aircraft? Are we putting it at a mine? Are we putting it in a warehouse? 
And then ultimately, to go back to the beginning, I mean, we're just trying to design something to connect that end device. We don't really care what it is and then carry the traffic back. Yes, yeah. It's pretty cool. That's that pretty cool. So, so what I heard is that uh, I could buy a briefcase LTE network from you and I could just like go into any random uh, area and, and start live streaming like this, <laughs> essentially. Really? On my own, on my own <laughs> private, on, 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 Kyle, on Kyle 5G. Right, I got my own network. Yeah, we, we, if I, if we, we I, can if make I, we can make that happen if I can pay for it. <laughs> if I can afford it, if awesome. You, if, if if you uh, if you come to our in our office in Atlanta, we have fifty thousand feet down in Atlanta, and we actually have a private LTE demo room where we have a lot of this stuff like kind of on display, different form factors, different vendors. Uh, it's getting uh, it's getting pretty cool. That's awesome. That's that's really cool. That's really cool, man. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll maybe we'll maybe we'll do a session there. We can uh, bring some of this to life. Maybe some drones and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that oh, that would be really cool. I got my drone over here somewhere. Um, uh, so, uh, question for you, and this kind of bleeds into my world with your world, um, which is pretty much the same world essentially. But I'm looking at this SD WAN box over here that has dual LTE SIM card slots on it. So, how much how much uh, does your world bleed into SD WAN? That is like software defined networking in the sense that you know we're we're bringing in like we're meshing networks together to create you know basically uh, you know uh, uh, IPsec tunnels across the internet through multiple mesh networks. Right. So, how much of that kind of bleeds into your world? Yeah, you know that's, that's an interesting coin. So we have a, a device segment of our uh, of our business. Last year we sold about five million cell modems, um, and and most of those modems go into some type of critical infrastructure, utility or or whatnot. So we're we're seeing um, we're, we're we're seeing on a public network. So we're putting a modem out. We're connecting up, let's say, a utility substation, and that substation may have a fiber circuit to it as the primary. And then it's using the cellular network as the backup, and they they they're setting up their network uh, by using SD WAN for that. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that in like that primary and backup scenario. Um, I, I think with private LTE, we'll see that too. Where if the client or 5G, um, I think currently where we have fiber, that will be primary, and then wh whether it's a modem on a public network or private network, that would be the backup. What's going to be interesting is if you're drinking the Kool-Aid of 5G, they're pushing that at some point in time, 5G could be so stable that that could be the primary and the other uh, means could be uh, backup. That seems wild, which is, but yes, I see it too. I, 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 you know, if, if, if you know, the Kool Aid's really got to be mixed up at that point. Oh but, yeah, because uh, you, you know, you're telling me that but, we would we would in favor of the this this fiber that we can see. We would, in favor of that, we would, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to trust the wireless more that I, that I can't actually see. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, I, I, that's wild. I, I mean, I'm, it's bold. Our, our primary business is wireless. And I, I, I would say, and we're, we're, we're bold, but we're not that bold. We're, we're like, nope, <laughs> use the fiber for your primary. And we're going to give you this great wireless 4G, 5G for your backup. But yep. you, that fiber is there. It's tangible. What we're doing is, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah. a black art. Right, Stay right. with the fiber. Put, Put, put put my house on the fiber, please. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, um, but, uh, what what else? Uh, what is something, if we flipped roles here for a second, you're in my shoes right now, what would you ask me that I haven't already asked you? Uh, cost. This all sounds great. What does it cost? All right, let's hear it. Um, well, <laughs> I, I think it's... Uh, <laughs> You set, you set yourself up for that one. My, uh, you set yourself up for that one. Try, well, I, 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 I was trying to answer your first question without realizing it was going to you know, circle back. But uh, that cost is a, is a part. I mean, you know, I, I think there's a few things here. There's a public network that's available today, 4G, a little bit of 5G. It's priced pretty effectively, right, on a monthly. You know, you can get a nice circuit for $40 a month as a consumer. Uh, as a business consumer, you're, you're getting a good rate for your uh, cost per megabit. So that's that's very viable. Uh, in your IT environment, Wi-Fi is very, you know, affordable. It's there. It's 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 in the you know all of the the chips. So it's it's very easy to. It, it's basically innate to your current situation, and and the price per 
uh, square foot is, is very, uh, let's say it's a dollar. Um, the comparison point, if you're going to build private LT, it's probably more like a dollar fifty to $2. Uh, so it's not something that's uh, the most cost effective from just a cost per square foot perspective. So you really have to look at, okay, do I want to have no infrastructure, just connect some uh, remote settings, use a public network? Right, because why? Why if it's uh, we see this with utilities, they have all these remote settings. They know they can't build towers and connect every dot, so they use the public network. Um, they have certain areas where Wi-Fi makes sense because it's dense, and they have uh, you know devices that are maybe Wi-Fi only. So that makes sense. And then there's you know mission critical applications that they're going to spend the two dollars because they want to have your grid be protected against uh, cybersecurity. So it is, there is a, um, a cost component. It's not flat across all these decisions. And uh, you know, a lot of times, it, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, advising clients on which cloud to use. I mean, you know, you could use Azure, you could use AWS. Um, and there's, you know, maybe some of the features match up, but then there's going to be, you know, folks that are really in the know on, on cloud like yourself you're going to be able to speak to the nuances of it's worth spending a little bit more money on this because what you're doing really requires this additional level of security and it's more encryption, whatever it is. Um, and and it's, it's really education. And, and, and sometimes we have clients that want the best because they could afford it. And we have to kind of rationalize that, you know, we're happy to do that. We're in the business to sell infrastructure, but you, you really don't need that. And we, we, we try to be, uh, look at it as a long-term partnership where we're not trying to sell the most expensive solution. We're trying to sell what makes sense. Um, like we, as much as today we talked about 4G and 5G, we do a lot of unlicensed networks and we do a lot of Wi-Fi networks. Um, it really just, it, it's a matter of finding the right balance of technical requirements and budget. So that's a, I brought up a hairy, uh, yeah. a hairy element because the, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you did. You, uh, I mean, shattered my dreams, man. Kyle, five G is not going to happen anytime soon. So, <laughs> wow. But you know, it's you, uh, you, you, you know, so, you, you know, you know, some people with good pricing. Maybe we could help you. That's true. That's true. I, ah, yeah, you know, that that is true. That is true. Um, well, I definitely appreciate it. Looks like we had uh, no, no takers on on the dial in today. Uh, that's okay. I see you guys watching. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we'll get you guys next time. We'll find a more compelling reason for you to call in. But that brings up this next segment here. <laughs> We're going to jump right into speed dial. Are you ready? Ready for this, Peter? Yeah. All right, cool. Let's um, do it. Uh, one word to summarize 2020. One word to summarize 2020. Uh, for you. I, I know you want me to say 5G, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, private LTE. Ah, okay. All right. That, that, fair enough. Um, what, was, what was the first mobile phone you ever used? This is very relevant for this conversation. Oh, it was a Motorola. Uh, uh, was the flip phone Star Touch, I guess. Star Touch, nice, nice. Uh, what What is the best business book of all time? Again, your opinion. Yeah, you know, I I like Jim Collins, and uh, I, I've read several of his books. Uh, Good to Great is is, uh, is is up there. Great by Choice, I also like because uh, I think you can make decisions to uh, push yourself to be successful. But uh, both of those are winners. Okay, cool. Which which one edge out, edges out the other one? Because remember, I said pick one. <laughs> good, good, good to great. Good to great. I, okay, I, all right. Good to I, great. I like that one. All right, cool. Um, digital resource uh, app or website that you just simply could not function without. Um, go go deep here. We 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 have developed. Uh, we use a quick basis the software stack that we use to run our business and between our CRM and our project management function. If that went off, uh, I'd have a big problem. Got it. What what about one that the rest of us could use? Like, what's what's an app or resource that is publicly available, even if you got to pay for it, like that you just can't live without? Uh, you know, we we use the hell out of Google Earth because a lot of times we're trying to. Someone says, "Here's a GPS location. I need to connect it," and we're like, "Well, what are you trying to connect?" And the only way to go out, and, you know, uh, short of actually going to the site, Google Earth is uh, is the, the next best thing. 
Nice. Uh, and, and Zian Kane just called you out, Peter. She said, uh, basically said that private LTE is not one word, but we'll, we'll give that to you. That's, uh, I, 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 that's, that's, that's fair. Uh, She's right. It's all good. It's all good. Um, uh, what, what would you tell, go back in time, you go back and tell yourself, your 18 year old self something, what would that be? Well, first thing would be graduate high school, uh, you know, focus on that. But uh, past that, uh, you know, I, I think that working hard is the most important thing and having loyal people. So, uh, you know, every day wake up, work hard, nothing's given to you. Like, uh, you know, my first job out of college, I was making $25,000. That was my, my first job because, and I, I barely graduated high school actually, uh, cause I enjoyed a lot of social life at that time. But, uh, you know, what, what changed is when I got to college, you know, work hard, get the grades. When I got out, I got an entry level job. I never did any internships in my uh, in my undergrad, and then ultimately I just worked harder than the people I competed against. And the second part is uh, I've been able to build a team of uh, loyal people, including the the founder of the company that let me be me, uh, our chief revenue officer who uh, was my mentor growing growing in the industry, and then we built a great team. Uh, so working hard and having great loyal people. I, I love that. And I wish we have harped more on that story because basically the, what I heard is barely graduating high school to CEO of future technologies. That's, that's incredible, man. Like that's, that's a great story. Um, yeah. So uh, on that theme, uh, name drop at least one person. Um, I, I have three here, but name up at least one person that had the biggest impact on your life thus far. I mean, probably it, it, it'd be the same name. I'm I'm Peter the Third, but uh, my father uh, definitely helped uh, kick me in the kick me in the uh, rear end when I needed it, and in, in gave me guidance, was patient with me through uh, not focusing on school, and uh, kind of pushed me pushed me uh, through college, and then uh, you know in in my current life, he happens to be a lawyer. You know, as, as I went from sales to CEO, deal with a lot of contracts and everything. And he's always been very helpful with me, um, you know, throughout, throughout the course of time. And in the industry, I would say it's, it's two of my partners. So uh, Dave Ramori was, uh, I was a, a 23 year old uh, guy that came to him and said, I have a, a $3 million order I want to place with you. And uh, I couldn't spell YMAX, but I literally had a $3 million order for him. And he basically kept me inside the guardrails uh, the first five years of my career and introduced me to uh, Future Tech. And um, Nino Canu, our founder, uh, he accepted me. I think the analogy that him and Dave uh, used was I was a Ferrari. The Ferraris are great when they're out on the highway and they're driving fast, but they need a lot of tinkering. And sometimes that's expensive. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's uh, those two guys have definitely been... Uh, uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, impactful for me from a career perspective, uh, and they're and they're great partners. Excellent, man. Excellent. Um, Chance Post, shout out to you out there. He said plastics. Uh, I'm, I'm missing the context here, man. I don't I don't know why he said that, but let me know later. I guess. Pla- plastic. <laughs> he said plastic cards. I don't know. Plastics. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me know later. Uh, best compliment that you have ever received in your career, Peter. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think, uh, I'm, br- I'm bringing the zingers. I'm bringing, I'm bringing the, the, the hard ones now. Yeah, no, no, no. You know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's nonverbal actually. I have an extremely loyal team that works, works very, very hard. And, you know, we're very competitive. We want to be better than everybody. And it doesn't happen by not showing up. Uh, I think we have a great loyal team of people that we've built that, uh, every day show up and work hard. And they're very, they're very loyal to myself and the company, which is, uh, we don't take that for granted. It's uh, we we can't we can't do it without the team. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Okay. Two only two more for you. Two left. Um, if uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. After, okay. Top celebrity, CEO, professional athlete, or living, dead, or alive, just top person in general that you wish you could meet, and what would you uh, discuss Me. with them? So, so yeah. which person, and then what I would discuss with them? Yep. Either you would want to meet that's currently living or someone that's no longer living, like you wish you could have. You know, I don't have it's a tough know, one Steve, too. Steve Jobs is it, uh, Steve Jobs is an interesting guy, you know, and I'm not 
I'm not a, I, I work on a, a Microsoft machine, so I'm not like one of these Apple people, but I uh, I've read, uh, <laughs> well, I, I have an Apple iPhone, I have an iPad, but I'm not, uh, I say heavily biased towards being Apple, but I, 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 I in hindsight, because I didn't pay attention as much when he was alive, in hindsight, reading books, he's an interesting fellow that was very driven and I, I think it would entertain me to, uh, uh, to, to, to sit with him and chat just because he had such a, from my perspective, a little bit of an eccentric, uh, very, very focused, uh, Demeter. And, uh, you know, being that he's not around, that's, uh, that's something that we, we, we can't do anymore. So right. that would probably be, uh, high, high on the list. Most definitely. Did, did you read his book? Well, not his book, but the book I, about I read- him. I read uh, the Jacobson's uh, biography yes. of him. That was uh, it was pr- pretty pretty good. I, I didn't know a lot of the backstory to be honest before the book, so that's what kind of intrigued me. Uh, did that? Did uh, that give you? Uh, uh, po- did it give you a more negative connotation, or just like a mixed uh, feeling about him with the fact that he's this genius, but then you know, some people question that he treated people a certain way, right? Maybe they say that he's a little yeah, harsh. Yeah, no, he was. They he, say he's he, a little I, harsh. I mean, I, 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 you know, I think uh, for me, I, I took from it, uh, like family, family is important. I have a great wife. I have a two-year-old son. I, uh, my brother works with us. Um, so family is very important. I was disappointed to hear how bad he was with his family. Um, I, you know, I don't idolize people that have the most money. Um, you know, when you die, it doesn't matter how much money you have. So I, I was disappointed to see how, um, especially as a, as a foster child, uh, that he wasn't better with his own daughter uh, because, you know, he basically replicated things. Um, that was, that was really disappointing. And then the other part was, it's great that you're driven and uh, you want to push the best out of everybody. But for me, try, you know, and who the hell am I to tell Steve Jobs? But like, it was disappointing to see how negative a lot of his employees were. Like he, they, they got res- he got results out of some of these individuals, but when they were done, they were um, many of them were, were turned off uh, by by his mannerism. And for me, it's kind of like, okay, how can you you channel the the, the positive part of this individual where you, you get the best out of the people that work with you, but you you have some quality with your family, and you know when when it's all done from a work perspective, you have relationships in place. And, um, you know, the, you know, the success is a success. Apple's fantastic, right? I mean, uh, he was part of, you know, great inventions, but, you know, I, I, uh, th- those two things were really things that I took away where, okay, let's replicate the success, but let's, let's try to be more well-rounded where, when it's all said and done for myself that, you know, I don't have <laughs> former employees saying the things that they said, and I, I, I want to be there for my family. Yeah, I know. No, very, very well said, man. Um, I, I took that that nugget out that you said about I don't idolize people for their money. Um, that's great, man. Great. We we think alike there. Uh, last one. Uh, what is a, a daily habit that you were just most dialed into to keep yourself uh, on top as CEO of Future Technologies? I I think you know just w- number one. You know, just showing up every day, bring energy, set the example, put the effort in, and you know, whether my task for the day is uh, something that's clerical or if it's negotiating the biggest contract, you know, bring it to each one of those activities, be a winner. And, it, you know, show that example about, uh, you know, being there the long hours, doing the things that are necessary and, and contribute to the team. I mean, uh, you have to try to lead by example. I mean, not, not everything I do is great, but uh, I would think that my team would say that I show up every day and I bring it. And, uh, yeah, that's that's important. All right, awesome, Peter. Well, dude, I definitely appreciate the the time today. Appreciate you coming on the show. Um, and uh, you know, guys out there on LinkedIn, go connect with Peter Capiello uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, we'll we'll tag him here below. So go connect with them. And of course, if you have any more questions, reach out to either of us. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks, Peter. Hey, thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it, man. All right, man. I guess have a good uh, rest of the Thursday. Cool. You too. 
Hey, live viewers, thank you so very much for tuning in today. If you found even a sliver of value in today's episode, please, please, please tell a friend, share this on LinkedIn, tag people below, or share this directly in DM. That would mean the world to me. Without sharing it, the content does not get seen. That's just how it works. And also, if you are unaware, this is now available on every single podcast platform that's out there. So uh, if you can't tune in live, no worries. Jump into the podcast. They're available almost immediately with our new streamline process. So we won't miss a beat now from now on. That's my that's my promise here. Um, but again, thank you so much for tuning in today. I uh, hope you guys have a great, wonderful rest of the day. And remember that thing that you're working on, that project that you've been putting off, uh, stop procrastinating. Stop worrying about the strategy. The strategy can come later. Just start executing. Just start doing. Go out there and do stuff, guys. Thanks. Have a great day, guys. Headphones off. Let's do it.